Although always present, individuals have, of late, been succumbing more and more to fear. This is not an instant life-or-death survival mode fear, but a lingering, background, ever-present kind of dread to which only obedience seems to somewhat appease, even if only slightly. We are now being forced to witness, as an external mist, the monster as the manipulator, usurper and leech it has always been. But the observant and contemplative among us will have realized by now that the actual monster emerging into the external environment is, actually, an internal fiend. It had always been there, in pleasingly good times and in bothersome bad tides. On one, sucking up our life force to feed a pretense self-importance that bloated our bubbles, only to collect later on, whenever time was ripe, for that bubble of make-believe to be threatened by a single pin. The monster is where it has always been, looking straight at us in the reflection of all the clothes and furnishings and decorations we have amassed to cover it up, to hide its ice-cold, fiery gaze that brings us shame to who we truly are. You see, in that reflection the Savior has always also been there, waiting patiently for the sign of aware decomposition to emerge, a sort of willing and alert acceptance of mortality. When the observer understands that the monster is the wizard behind the curtain of one's own surrounding script, tricking us as lost guardians, into fearing the illusionist fireworks and stage effects through self-deceit, something addressed also previously in the contemplation exactly named self-deceit, the Savior shines through that now abhorrent image and opens his true arms. Yet so many of us flee, seemingly eternally, from such a reflection, from the monster's stare in denial. So many of us have allowed themselves to be convinced that abominable, manipulative, parasitical monsters are actually beautiful, good-willed, gracious saviors, only because that is preferable to accept in self-deceit than the alternative, a script existence that is meaningless and with no glimpse of truth. Nevertheless, for those who have life within, no matter how hard and how long they self-deceive themselves into believing, worshipping and trusting the monster of their reflection, there will always be a discomfort hand in hand with them, as a silent guide, a truthful companion that continuously tries to warn the willingly deaf and blind that no matter how hard they try to be like the monster, they will never fit in because the monster can use life to generate food for himself, but the monster can never, ever be or even come in contact with life. That would cause it to dissolve into nothingness. So the living contribute creatively to their own identified character stories and feed these screenplays individually and collectively because of this fear. Partly a fear of the monster's gaze, yes, which is an illusion, as it can never ever touch actual life. But mostly a fear of losing that identification with the monster, and of, therefore, losing one's place in the ongoing, lifelong movie. Some say they have faith, and yet... They cover themselves up with second-hand depictions instead of coming face to face with their true salvation. Others say they have no faith at all, yet they trust that these monsters they feed will not eat it all up if they are given the chance, that there will be a crumb that is large enough to keep their characters going. This is not to say that no characters have any possible redemption or salvation, not at all. Characters are as needed to keep the metaphorical projected scripted movie going on 
as they are needed in the also metaphorical, manifested, improvised theatre play. More about this in the contemplation named Shadow Play. It is a fact that some characters are only fitting for the self-deceit implications of existence in that projection, but characters that become self-aware, that is, aware of being metaphorical characters, can then choose morally to align themselves with the also metaphorical true actors that are playing them, instead of submerging more and more into the illusion set before them by the scriptwriter monsters. One thing must be fully realized. The movie, the script, is being played backwards. That is, it is not expanding or evolving, as it is the preferred delusion of what is called modernity, but actually contracting and devolving towards a point of self-destruction. That self-destruction is, on one hand, what the monster's shadows we reflect want to avoid by performing some damage control and attempting to minimize losses, that is, to minimize the number of characters that shift from alignment with the monster movie towards an alignment with the true actor that plays them, metaphorically speaking. On the other hand, however, the monsters know that the movie ending, the climax to this contraction of their projected cinema, is inevitable, and perhaps only delayable. And we also know, given we have the monsters inside as well, even if we, again, self-deceive. So, they try to minimize losses, but they also prepare for what will be their final feast. All the unredeemable movie characters, props and scenarios will be gobbled up by themselves. What is left? The full extent and the glory of the stage we prepared for a direct manifestation of truth. You see, when we wrote the scriptwriter in, uh, for this please refer to the contemplation named role-playing game, the stage we set up was unimaginably huge, both in size and in scope. And even though truth is by itself uncreated and timeless, it enjoys manifesting itself, gracious and playful as a pure child as it is. Over this blissful metaphorical painting, we blotted the fog in to pretend we were dead. So we taught ourselves, as dogs, our first trick, play dead. For countless scenes and lines in an ever-edited script, edits made by both the monster and the savior, the former pulling us in, the latter offering us choices, we have been chasing the solution to the puzzle this fogged world sets before us, and, simultaneously, running away from that very solution. It is, in my view, a moral choice, as stated many times before, but especially in the contemplation with the same name. A moral choice that is made alone, gazing at our own reflection in the mirror of our souls. A choice to offer service, even to the poor monster that begs for forgiveness and redemption, if he has actually willingly seen for the first time his disgraceful condition reflected in truth, please refer to the contemplation named service. A choice to lead that once ice-cold, fiery gaze of hatred, resentment and disregard to a transmutation into love, forgiveness and understanding. And for all that, we need to have a strong and healthy ego, because it is he who makes this choice in ourselves. At the same time that the monster shadows have been scripting their victory in multiple possible scenarios, they have been offering our characters time and time again these opportunities to look in the mirror. All it takes is an instant of realization. The monster then becomes reconnected to the savior that guides him through the fog, letting go of one piece of movie clothing, furnishing and decoration at every step, back to its proper ancestral place in the improvised play. 
in the same manner that we have written in our deaths, being living entities, we have written in our own resurrections. It is being reflected back at us continuously in the shape of the discomfort we feel here so that this can be the moral guide to our choices in the presence of our unveiled selves.